thanks Rob for joining us tonight. It started that I was going to uh, do this presentation and I was working through um, some PowerPoint and I thought, well, Rob probably has some already. So I sent him an email and um, sure enough he did, but uh, he kindly offered to, uh, to do this presentation, which was perfect. Rob is um, one of the founding members of uh, CW Ops, I guess, uh, CW Ops member number three. I've worked uh, Rob uh, many, many dozens of times on the uh, contest, well over 100, I would guess. And uh, he is also um, one of the members or the founding members rather of the CW Ops Academy that um, take on teaching um, new hams or any ham for that matter who wants to uh, learn uh, Morse code. So he is probably uh, really well um, best positioned to, uh, to talk to you about that. He's, uh, he's trained many hams in the past. So uh, with that, I'll pass it over to uh, to Rob K6RB and um, let him uh, uh, talk about learning more scope. Go ahead, Rob. Okay, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Mm -hmm. Can you hear that okay too? Yes. Okay. So um, first of all, thank you, Jeff, for uh, connecting with me. And we did need the uh, presentation on learning CW, which... I generated after I got your email. So that's now part of our, uh, our uh, set of four presentations that we have in the members only section of our website. So I thank you for that. Mm -hmm. It was something that we should have done a while back and I just never got around to it. Um, before I get into what I was gonna talk about tonight, I thought it might be helpful to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of how all this kind of came about CW Ops and so forth. Um, back in the mid fifties, the Russians launched a satellite called Sputnik that circumnavigated the earth and produced beeps basically on 14 megahertz. <laughs> and the United States government at that time said, uh oh, looks like those Russians are gonna be outclassing us in science and math. So we need to really beef ourselves up. So the, the concept of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math is actually not a new concept. It began in the mid fifties. And I was one of the products of that. In my elementary school, there was suddenly, you know, this big emphasis on science and scientific stuff. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that got me into ham radio. So I got my initial license and in the, in the US it's called the novice license in 1958, 5-8, at the age of 11. And I've been at it for 62 years now. <laughs> and I have to tell you that I like it as much today as I did back in 1958. And I'm probably more active today than I, was back in 1958. But um, roughly 10 years ago, uh, about a dozen of people that I knew, Morse code operators, started emailing one another about all these other Morse code clubs or CW clubs. And the one thing that none of them seemed to have was a mentoring program. They all kind of, you know, some of them, all you had to do to join was send money. <laughs> Other ones uh, were very kind of el elitist and you couldn't join unless they invited you. You couldn't ask. And once you were invited to join, you couldn't tell anybody that you were trying to join. Uh, that's the group called FOC. So we decided let's make CW Ops and have it be really broad because some of these clubs, it's only straight keys. Some of these clubs, it's only about contesting. Some of these clubs, it's only about rag chewing. And we said, why not have a club that's, if it's CW, we support it. And probably six months after we started that club in January of 2010, there was a, an event in the United States called Rookie Roundup. 
and it was a CW rookie roundup. And our then president participated in it. And a couple of days later, he said, oh, it was just horrifyingly bad how poor the CW of these people were and so on and so forth. And we really ought to have a mentoring program for people to show them how to do it right. And of course, in those days, the old maxim of when you need something done, always ask somebody who's busy. <laughs> so they said to me, hey, you know, why don't you, in addition to all the other stuff that you're doing, figure out what we should be doing on this mentoring thing. And that was the beginning of CW Academy. And originally it was started as kind of a marriage brokerage where people that wanted help would tell us a little bit about themselves, what bands they could operate on, what days and times, and people that were willing to help could say what bands they operated and what days and times, and we were gonna to try to marry them. Didn't work at all. <laughs> so a few months later, we completely restructured and today's CW Academy is actually very similar to what we came up with in 2011. Um, here was the interesting thing. The original CW mentoring program was meant for people who already knew Morse code, just didn't know it very well and needed to get better at it. And so we put the word out and started getting people signing up and to our chagrin, 75% of the people that signed up were beginners who knew no Morse code or a little. And we went, holy mackerel, what we've come up with was really to mentor people who already are on the air and stuck at 10 words a minute. What do we do here? So I kind of scrambled and started a beginner's program for people that don't know Morse code. And so tonight's presentation about learning CW is one of the things we grappled with. How do you do that? Because people like me in 1958, the way we did it was we listened to W1AW code practice and we just tried, you know, to get our five words a minute licenses and then got on the air and the blind leading the blind and hoped that within a year, we would get up to 13 words a minute and get our general. Um, to put it in perspective, I started at five words a minute in 1958 and I broke 20 words a minute in 1970, 12 years. And my goal was to get somebody from zero to 20 words a minute in eight weeks. So with that, I'm gonna share the screen. And here we go. I hope you can all see that. So the very first thing that we had to deal with was how do you teach Morse code? What do you need to do? Because back in the day, you wrote everything down. And when you took the test at the FCC, or I imagine it at the authority that does licensing in Canada, they would send code and you wrote it down and they'd look at what you wrote down and compare it to what they thought was sent and passed you or failed you. And in the beginning, Morse code was meant to be a messaging methodology where you, somebody told you, here's the message I need you to send it. You had to get it verbatim and then send it to somebody else. And he had to copy it verbatim. And eventually it got to the, the intended recipient, hopefully verbatim. But nowadays, that's an anachronism. No one sends radiograms except kind of gratuitously and for fun. We don't depend on it. So what we do with Morse code these days is we contest, we chase the X, and we rag chew. And when we rag chew, people that are good at it don't write anything. They sit back and they listen and they get it and they send and they know what they're gonna send. And, and it's a conversation. The only difference is instead of saying words to each other, we're using our fingers and sending words to each other. So 
That was one of the first things we had to grapple with. Do we want to teach people how to write stuff down or copy in their head? Second thing was when we first learned it, we learned it proportionately so that five words a minute, letter speed and word speed, it was like watching paint dry. It was so slow. And people got in the habit of remembering, oh, the C is a dash dot dash dot or da dit da dit. They would count dits and da's. Bad. And then the last thing was, well, do we teach them how to do it with a hand key first and then get them up to maybe a bug or a keyer later? Or do we start them right on a keyer at day one? So the answers that we chose were, learn to copy in your head, don't write anything down. Start with a letter speed of 20 words per minute and use a paddle and a keyer from the start. Why? Well, you learn to copy in your head because if you're gonna do conversational, that's the way to go. And if you're going to do contesting where you're using a computer and a keyboard, that's another set of skills that you need to learn. But the head copying doesn't detract from that, it actually helps it. Why start with a letter speed of 20? So that you can't count dits and daws. You learn to recognize letters by their sound, not how many dits and daws they have and in what order. And use a paddle from the start so that you can learn to send at a speed that's practical. Five words a minute, 10 words a minute, it it's, makes your eyes glaze over, it's so slow. So those were our initial uh, decisions. Now, a little bit about Morse code, and I'm sure a lot of you are Morse code operators, so this is probably all new, not new stuff. But it's there are people that swear up and down, Morse code's a language. It's not a language. I can learn Morse code and talk to somebody in French or German or English or Spanish using the same letters. It's not a language. It's an encoding and decoding of alphabetic characters using sound patterns. And what it, the language it ends up being depends on what words you spell with it. Unlike RIDI or FT, whatever, <laughs> it can be done using your ears, your brain, and your hands. You don't need a computer. And that's important because people that do soda, summits on the air, climb 2,000, 3,000 feet up. They don't want to carry 10 pounds of radio. They want the smallest thing they can get away with. And the smallest thing you can get away with is a little QRP CW rig. So you get to the top of the mountain, throw a wire in the tree, and away you go. The most common error that slows people down and hampers their being able to learn Morse code is counting dits and daws. So start them at a speed where they can't do that. Make them learn to recognize the sound of a letter rather than its combination of dits and daws. Okay, so one of the problems with learning to do head copy is that we're not used to talking that way. And by that, I mean, we don't say to each other, H-E-Y, J-E-R-R-Y, H-O-W, A-R-E-E, Y-O-U, T-O-N-I-G-H-T. We don't do that. And yet we do when we send Morse code. We spell stuff out. So it's learning a new way to hear and compute <laughs> and recognize. So what, what it's all about is getting people used to first learning the letters, then recognizing groups of letters and what they mean. And so what I just demonstrated, for example, was uh, I was sending it about 25 words a minute when I spelled that out. But let me get down to 20 words a minute. How about E? A T A T T E N E at 10. It's a short phrase. 
And that's one of the first things that we teach people when they start taking the beginner's program in CW Academy. So we start with four letters, E, T, We send them alternately so people hear the difference. We move on to the A. And then the N. Four things. T, E, A, and N. And you can spell eat at 10. So the very first lesson, they learn those four things. They learn to, and you can spell a lot of words with that. You can spell T, T-E-E -E if you're a golfer, T, T-E-A if you like to drink beverage, N-E-T, T-E-N, N-E-A-T. You can have four letter words, three letter words, two letter words, at, uh. <laughs> anyway, when we get done with that first lesson, they're learning to copy those four letters and those words and those short phrases at 20 words a minute. And when we get done and we say, by the way, you know, you were copying that at 20 words a minute, they're like, oh my God. And then each week, or I should say each session, there's two a week or eight weeks, so 16 sessions, we add some more letters. By the first week, the second session, they have T-E-A-N-O-I-S-N-R. And we add the numbers one and four. So by the end of the first week, I can start sending call signs. N-1-E-A. We don't get to a V until a little bit later. So I can't send some uh, Canadian call signs initially. It's all US call signs, but call signs, right? So they're learning call signs, they're learning words, they're learning short phrases from the very beginning at a letter speed of 20 words a minute. Now, in the beginning, people can't process that at 20 words a minute word speed. So we do what's known as Farnsworth. We slow the timing between the letters. So even though the letter is getting sent at 20 words a minute, the word might be only 15. And then as they begin to recognize the letters, we shrink that delay and we get it to 20. So ultimately our primary objective at the end of those eight weeks is to have them copying some stuff at 20 words a minute. Worst case, maybe 15. And then they move on. So, like I said, eight weeks, four letters, and we begin introducing numbers early and non-sequentially. It's very important. I explained to my students that numbers are the only thing in Morse code that are logical. Everything else is totally illogical. Numbers are one, two, three, four. In the beginning, the first five digits start with a dit, then two dits, then three dits, then four dits, then five dits. And then it's the opposite, da, So you could try to do it that way. Go, how many dits was that? But we don't want you to. So we look, teach you a one and a four. They're very different. And you get to re recognize the one and you get to recognize the four. So when I send a call sign like, You get it. Maybe the next week you learn two and five, three and six. So they're non-sequential because we want you recognizing the pattern and not figuring out the, the logic. Okay, so here's how it spreads out those eight weeks. First five weeks, you learn all 26 letters, all 10 numerals, a couple of punctuations, period and question mark some Q codes, QRZ, QRS, Q 
QSO, <laughs> some abbreviations, UR, uh, VY. So they're beginning to see, oh, wow, you can really cut the time down by abbreviating and still get the, the, the idea. Call signs, lots of call signs. The more no letters they learn, the more DX call signs we throw at them. And then at the very end, we begin introducing QSO messaging. How do you do a QSO? What's the first exchange? Signal report, location, and name. What's the second exchange? Maybe weather, rig information, and a little bit about yourself, age, how long you've been a ham. What about after that? It's up to you. Some people stop at that point, say, sorry, have to leave. Nice to meet you. 73s, goodbye. We call that a wrap exchange. So a typical QSO could be a first exchange, a second exchange, and a wrap exchange, which is 95% of the QSOs. They learn that. And in the three weeks remaining, we simulate it. I call CQ. They come back. I do an RSTQTH name, and they do theirs. And every time I do it, I change my call sign, my name, and my QTH so they can never anticipate. And it's great. And they learn what it's like. It's simulated, of course, and it's not on the air. It's, on, it's online, but it doesn't matter because it's the same. And then when they finally do get on the air, it's not like, oh, my God. They know what to do because they've had some practice. And then the very last week, we do some simulated contests, DX condition pileups, and so on. So they get to see what it's like. I teach them, hey, if you're going to do a pileup, um, don't, if you're running 25 watts to a wire out your window, and this is like the, the number eight most rare D expedition in, in the world, it's not probably a great idea to try to work them on day one. Let the guys with the antennas and the amplifiers and all that kind of stuff work them and get it done. Work them on day five when they're calling CQ and no one's coming back to them. And so we teach them, we teach them, we mentor them, truly mentor them, not just how to learn letters, but how to apply it, how to get on the air, how to do the three major things that people do with CW, which is rag chew, work DX, and contest. Okay. Then we move them to the next thing, which is the basic curriculum, where we focus on instant character recognition because it's critical. What slows you down in copying, head copying Morse code is the time it takes to recognize the pattern and recognize it as a letter in your head. If I say to Jim, J-I-M, he's on it. But if I say to Jim and he's new to CW, he's got to hear that J, that I, that M, oh, it's my name. So the instant character recognition is really, really, we try to shrink it down, shrink it down, get it to where they're really just getting it instantly. And then working on the problem characters and numbers. Everybody has different characters that screw them up and identify them and figure out how to work around those. And then head copy practice and QSO practice. Then the third level, the intermediate, now they're starting to head copy stories and QSO messaging type stuff. They're using freeware, Rough CXP, which is a call sign copy practice program where they're learning to hear a call sign and type it in. And this program is a wonderful program. So it's a German program. And when you start out at say, say maybe 10 words a minute and you get the first one and you type it in and you get it right. The next one comes at you at 11 or 12 words a minute, you type it in, you get it right and it's 15. It's finally you get up to 18 and you screw it up, it goes back to 15. So it just keeps walking you up and then walks you back down and walks you back up and walks you back down and it keeps you right up against your, your wall. And each time you do it, it gives you this score and it tells you what the fastest call sign copy speed was. And it's really very empowering each time you do it 
Last time I did it, the fastest was 18. This time I was up to 22. Wow, that's fantastic. That's progress. Morse Rudder simulates the WPX contest. Exactly. Same exchange, same everything. The guy throws lids at you and QRN and QSB and all kinds of stuff. And four people calling you at the same time and all that stuff. And it's great. It's keyboard practice. It's learning how to really run in a contest, which is the hardest part. s and p is easy. And then QSO and contest practice. And I always start my groups first, learning how to s and Why? Because you can take as long as you need. If you hear somebody sending CQ at 30 words a minute, you can sit there for five minutes until you get all the info and then call. You can't do that when you're running. If you're running at 25 and somebody comes back to you at 25 and you miss the call and you send question mark and they send it again and you still miss it, they're not gonna be thrilled with you. So we, we teach them first learn to s and and then put your toe in the running water and start running and learn how to run. And that's a great tool for learning how to run, Morse Runner. In the advanced curriculum, just like intermediate, only faster. Stories, QSOs, rough CXP, Morse Runner, and eight weeks of CWT. And if you don't know CWT, I know Jim knows CWT, but if you don't know CWT, the average speed of CWT is 32 words a minute. It's fast. And yet, I get people after eight weeks that can copy call signs at 30 words a minute. It might take 12 times, but they'll get it. And so they learn it. And that's essentially what I, all I want to say then about um, learning Morse code. And that's exactly what we do with uh, CW Academy. So with that, if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Okay, Rob, thank you so much. I, I, I thought I was a very experienced CW op, but I already learned a bunch of stuff. We didn't have the uh, Farnsworth uh, method when I learned it off uh, LP records. I, I memorized each band on the LP record and, uh, and then uh, went on to copying uh, cipher groups from submarines in the Great Lakes. Right. And, uh, and they were at different speeds and whatever, but uh, I never really listened too much to W1AW, but I, I learned about your program tonight. I really didn't know anything about it till now and it looks fantastic, um, but it is a commitment. And uh, uh, one question I have for you is uh, how many people do you take into one group? Uh, and uh, how, how uh, well do they do? How many survive it? Well, that's a great question, Jerry. Um, first of all, let me start out by saying it's free. <laughs> uh, the second thing is we do it three times a year, January, February, April, May, and September and October. So, um, there's a way to sign up on our website, which is cwops.org. And uh, once you sign up, they queue you in. And the way it works, we have right now 80, 80 volunteers. And each of us does at least one class a semester. I've been known to do three. But I said, I was 70 and I said, hey, you know, maybe two, two or one. But anyway, um, I always keep my classes from six or less because I want everybody to get a certain amount of attention. So, and that's pretty typical. Most classes are five or six maximum. So you figure 80 people, five average. So we do 400 people a semester, 1,200 people a year. How much of your uh, your classes is live versus uh, what you can work sort of in a online session that's been pre-programmed or pre-recorded? Another great question. This was very important because when I first started it, I started to say, who wants to volunteer to be an instructor? And people go, oh, I can't teach. 
I went, oh, wrong choice of word. So I changed it to, who wants to be an advisor? Oh, okay. So what I did was create classes and curriculum that are self-teaching. So the student actually teaches themselves with the tools that we provide them in the streaming files that are on the website. And when they meet twice a week with the advisor, they've already done the assignment and the advisor says, okay, how did you do with that? Well, this and that, but I ran into a problem with this and what do I do with that? Great. So then he says, well, why don't you try this? Oh, okay. And at the end of that 45 minutes to an hour, they've gone through what they just did three days leading up to that session and they've gotten personalized stuff from, from the examiner. Give you a perfect example. Uh, it's not unusual in beginner group after the first session, when we get to the second session, or even at the beginning, the first session, and I say to somebody, well, how'd you do with that? And they go, yeah, you know, I'm having problems. I, I mix up the A and the N. And I said, well, I'm going to tell you what I want you to do. Before you start your sending practice, and there's sending practice with every session, not just copying, sending. Their sending practice. With the sending practice, I say, okay, I want, what I want you to do before you do anything else, listen. You know what that is? Yeah, A-N-N-A, -N -N -A. right, that's the word Anna. I want you to send Anna five times in a row before you do the rest of your assignment. Trust me, by the end of the first week, that guy knows A's and N's. <laughs> so that's one, one little exercise that we do. Um, the other thing is the sending part where people will say, oh, I got this paddle and this here, but God, I, 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 I can't control it. And they go, okay, listen to the here. Those are dits, right? Yep. Those are daws, right? Yep. Which is longer? Well, the daw. Well, how much longer? I don't know. I don't know three times. So, Think about cars going down a road. One of them's going 90, one of them's going 30. Which one's easier to control? Well, the one going 30, right. So the hard one is the one going 90. So what you wanna do is practice this little limerick. Etc. Once you get done doing that, now you have your dit, your thumb under control, then try some hybrids. So they get the idea that if you don't master the paddle, it will master you. And we all hear people on the air whose paddles have mastered them. And we don't want that. We want people to learn. The other thing that we really stress is timing. I start with T, T-E-A. I go, listen to the word T. Now, the same code elements, da, di, di, da, could also be, can you hear the difference? They mean two different things, T-E-A, N-A. Here's another one, T. Same code elements, different timing. So we stress that, get that timing, really pay attention. And I check with them every time we meet, I get them sending and I'll say, you know, you need to leave a little bit more space between those characters, oh, okay. Or some people leave too much space. So we work on the timing, we work on the patterns. It's all good. Anything else, Jerry? So um, I'm just curious if people make it past the first session, are they in or do they drop out after one or how does how do your uh, statistics show? Well, recidivism that? rate is 80 to 85 percent. That means if we start out with five on day one, we end up with five 
on the last session, 80 to 85 percent of the time. We will lose people and usually it's because something came up and their schedule changed and suddenly they, they were committed, but now they can't anymore. We'll also get situations where people jump into the pool at the deep end with their hands tied behind their back. They really shouldn't have gone into intermediate. They should have gone to basic because their instant character recognition isn't up to snuff yet. And so we'll say, okay, we'll move you into, into basic. Oh, okay. But what do you find? We've got a what do you, lot of people completing it. Good. That's very good. What do you find about age groups? Great question. We started a thing called Youth CW Academy that's geared to people between the ages of 11 and 19. And we break them into age peers 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So you're never in a group where anybody's more than two years older or younger than you. You don't want an 11 and a 19 year old in the same group, it doesn't work. So that's one group where just in the beginning stages of that, it's just starting to happen. I had a session the other day, I had six kids between the ages of nine and 14. And it was fun. I don't know if they're gonna join. It was sort of like a demo. Hey, let me show you how this works. Now I'm waiting to get people signing up. But in our regular groups, it's all over the map. I would say average age, 55. Interestingly, I had a group a couple of years ago, intermediate group. And one of my people was 84 years old. And what I do with my intermediate group, the very first time we meet, is I send Morse code to them at, a, let's say, 18 words a minute. And I'll say, did you get that? Yeah, you know, you sent so-and-so, okay. Next guy, did you get that? No, huh? 15. Yeah, I got that, okay, good. I get to the 84 year old, I send it at 18. I said, did you get that? He goes, no, and I think I'm in over my head and I'm gonna probably throw in the towel. I said, well, you can't. No one's allowed to leave my group, you gotta stay. And he did. And at the end of eight weeks, he was the second best student in the group. Did he have problems remembering what he was copying? No. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Um, one, one more question. Uh, for people who want to do this, but they don't have a keyer or a practice oscillator, what do you recommend? A um, couple of things. If they have a radio with a built-in keyer, mm -hmm. borrow a paddle from somebody or buy an inexpensive paddle and you're set to go. If you don't have a radio and you want to get a paddle and a keyer, the, the least expensive new paddles and keyers that we've found that are acceptable, Vibroplex has a thing called the Code Warrior Junior Paddle. I think it's about a hundred bucks. And micro, uh, not micro, MFJ has a thing called the Econo Keyer, which is also in that area of about a hundred bucks. So for, you know, $200 or so, you got everything you need. And the beauty of it is you can, you can use it. You can, if you get a radio later that has no keyer, you're there. You got a keyer and a paddle. If not, you could always sell it back and probably get back half your money. So um, that would be our recommendation. First, see if you can borrow one from somebody. If you can, great. If you can't, then, you know, you have some options. You can even get used ones. I mean, it, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about buying a $300 paddle, you know, it's not important. Just get something to get started with, learn what you're doing and get the right equipment. <laughs> When I first started learning uh, certain musical instruments, a teacher told me it was very important to buy a quality instrument or you're gonna learn to play it poorly or incorrectly. So how, how important is getting a decent paddle or what would you consider a decent paddle? Well, like I said, the Code Warrior Junior, I have one. In fact, if you hang on a second, I'll show you.
So here's the unit. You have the paddle up on top, which connects to it. And then the bottom part is the Econo here. And I don't know if the battery is, yeah. Yeah, we're not hearing it. No, okay. Anyway, um, it, it works and it's, it's fine. Um, I've actually, where I had people that didn't have equipment a few days before we started the class, I've thrown it into, you know, UPS and sent it to them and they used it and sent it back to me when they finished. So it, it's a, it's perfectly fine. I would say that's minimum. I wouldn't get anything like, um, oh, a BY1, um, oh, what the heck is the name of it? Bencher. Bencher. They're very sloppy. That spring really allows a lot of vertical play in the tabs, and that's sloppy. That's what I use. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> get yourself a Code Warrior Junior. You want, to, you want something that doesn't have up and down motion, just side to side. It, you, it, adds, it adds an accuracy. You'll be surprised. I used benches for years, and then I got a Kent, and all of a sudden my sending improved about 90% because of, you know, I was just not making these mistakes anymore. And I'm thinking, oh, it had nothing to do with my skill. It was just a better, a better paddle. Mm -hmm. I just bought. I just bought a Kent about uh, two weeks ago, and You're wonderful. Uh, I uh, paid maybe a little too much, but I can't decide if it's nicer than or, or the Begalis. I got two Begalis. I have a Begali and I have a Kent, and I have an old Vibro here, and I can use them all. Um, I use my Begali simply because of how much it cost, and I got it for free. It was a a raffle prize, but um, would I have bought it and spent the money? Probably not. I love my Kent. I still use my Kent all the time. Any other questions for Rob? Yeah, Vince here. Go ahead, Vince. And, and Rob, so how do you feel about, um, how do you feel about uh, Morse tutors? Uh, there's a number of them out there. Um, on the market that uh, a guy can use? Okay, that's a great question. One of the things that came up when we first started CW Academy was there were already products out there. G4 FOMs, Koch Trainer. Um, my very good friend uh, Fabian has that thing, Learn CW Online. Wonderful programs, very, you know, flexible. You can create your own letters and words and work on things that give you grief. The one thing that's missing is the other human being on the other end who can give you feedback. They, they can't give you feedback. And we found that was critical. We, when we did um, surveys of people after they took the class and we said, in terms of you know one to 10, how do you rate these various aspects of the class? Almost always, number one was the, the advisor having a, somebody to give us feedback. We found out, and, and we didn't think about that at the time, but that's turned out to be a really critical element. So the answer is those things are great, but you need somebody to help you figure out what to do with it. And give you feedback when you run into a problem because you're not going to get that from an online program that's not a human being. So this is more feedback than just you formulated the letter F correctly or the letter H correctly you're talking about. You're talking about that real coaching element. Sure. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, a lot of times in my session, stuff will come up where it'll you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, you know, I started out okay. And then after about 15 minutes into the QSO, I started making a lot of errors. And I said, well, how far apart are your contacts? And he showed me and they were like an eighth of an inch apart. I go, 
crank them down. <laughs> you know, you, you're going like this instead of like this. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> so, I mean, it, you're not going to learn that from a program on the air that's good, or a program online. You're going to learn that from a human being who goes, been there, done that. Let me tell you, kid. Yeah, right on. Very good. Thank you. Sure. I think after you pass, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Dee. I was just going to say, once you get past the, uh, maybe the intermediate stage and you you have some idea of timing uh, when it comes to sending and you really want to increase your speed, there's a, uh, they may be more uh, applicable. There's a number of them on online. Uh, Kurt, you know, Kurt Zogelman, uh, Rob? I know, I, I know, I know Morse, the name. Morse Code Ninja. Okay. He's, he's he's got a series of great videos. I think he's a CW. I, yes, right? I do know yeah. who he is. Yeah, and he's got a. Um, I've I've got uh, about five hours of his uh, uh, recordings on my phone that I'll listen to from time to time. When you want to increase speed for uh, contesting and the like, it's very very useful. Well, and I know in, in my own case, like I said, it took me twelve years to get to twenty words a minute. It took me two more years to get to 25. Mm -hmm. And that was stuck. 25 was about as good as it got. And then a friend of mine, WA60, said to me, have you tried PID? I said, what? He's a, he was a Russian expat. PED. I go, what the heck is PED? He goes, it's a Japanese program using DOS that, that simulates a contest. And he showed me how to download it. And I started using it. The point is, once I started using a contest program like Morse Runner or PED or any of these things, my speed suddenly went from 25 to 45. Hmm. Never would have happened just getting on the air casually. And then once I hit, I've actually been certified at one of the ham events, the Dayton ham event last year at 52 words a minute accurate call sign copy, 52. Can I do a QSO at 52? No. <laughs> what about 45? Uh-uh. I can do a QSO at 35 without breaking a sweat, but not 45. But I can copy call signs at 40 plus. Um, it all, it all it's, it's, it's symbiotic. When you learn to send and receive you know, very high speeds in a contest kind of environment, and then you go back to rag chewing, it all helps. It's like muscle exercises. And so, yeah, you know, um, these programs and things that are out there are all great. But you, gotta, you, you need that foundation in that. And that we really don't know a way to get there without a human being. One thing I was going to say is that whatever you use, you... Uh... You have to mix it up. Um, when I was a kid, you know, I was sending to myself before I had a tape recorder. So you're going da da dit kind of in your mind or or whatever, and then uh, and then later on you listen on the air. And and I I when I had my first breakthrough, as I uh, when I was younger, I had a, a real asthma problem. I'd wake up in the middle of the night, and I'd just get on the air and just listen, just listen. And I was almost half asleep, you know, kind of semi-conscious. And it's amazing how you just let that flow into your head. But it isn't, the, it isn't the only thing, you know. And uh, going to work on the C train, you have MP3s you listen to. and But you don't just go at a higher speed. You go higher and lower, faster, slower, because Absolutely. you get bored. Yep. And as you get older, you kind of fall asleep if it's too slow. So, Absolutely. Uh, you know, and, and then I discovered Wordsworth instead of Farnsworth, and you can actually um, make, I think it's FL Digi, crank out stuff if you want, right? So sure. all this stuff, you know, you know now, now I'm trying to practice just learning words and hearing words for higher speed QSO stuff, right? But uh, yep. so you, you got to just keep at it in whatever way you can, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have people in the club that can copy 50 plus words a minute. <clears throat> And I think to myself, well, how important is it for me to copy 50 plus words a minute? I think practically speaking for a QSO rag chew 
that doesn't make your eyes glaze over because it's too slow or make you have to work too hard and because it's too fast. Somewhere between 25 and 30 is the ideal. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we set 25 as our requirement to get into CWFs. If you can send 25 and copy 25, you can rag true, you can contest, you can do all of it. And then you can decide what way your passion is and go down that road. I think that's a really good point there, Rob, is uh, one of the main reasons that I, I uh, wanted to uh, pick up my CW again. I'm one of the typical people that learned it as a teenager and then went to to uh, university and worked and then I came back in 25 years later and I had to start writing it all down again because I it was all rusty but it was still there sure. and re recovered it but my main goal was DX and so if you're trying to work the pileups if you're trying to work uh, DX you need to be able to at least do 20 words a minute absolutely so if, if you can't do that you won't you won't uh, succeed in that 25 is better uh, and then, of course, you've got noise thrown in and you've got QSB. Uh, so you've got all these other things to, to deal with. Uh, and then, of course, uh, in a pileup, you're giving your call over and over again. So you typically program a function key to sure. give your call. But you've got to be able to recognize when they call you back. Yes. And there's other skills involved. So, yeah, I, I can see that uh, you may want to... Uh, go for speed, but uh, there's no real practical reason once you get to where you can meet your goals. And if, exactly. you're, if you're contesting, exactly. that's a different story. But what we're talking about here is getting people with their feet wet and, and uh, not trying to scare them off with speed, Ooh. but to get them working towards something that's realistic and that's going to be a lot of fun for, for working DX. And that's exactly what we're trying to do as well. So we're totally simpatico. I, I think another another point is that I don't know if uh, maybe maybe other people do, but I don't know if you ever get over feeling chicken, you know, um, <laughs> you leave the code for a while and you get on and and yeah, you jump in there and you know, yeah, you haven't touched the gear for quite a long time and you go bloop, bloop, bloop or whatever the heck it is or you miss part of it. When I was a kid, I, I actually, when I first started working, I was like Jerry, I want to work some DX. So the first thing I did was hook up a cassette recorder and I had a pile of cassettes. And whenever I worked somebody, I made, you know, I don't go back, you know, you couldn't go back to the spotting to make sure you had the call sign, right? Sure. So, you know, I'd work the guy and I'd record the QSO and then I'd listen to it afterwards and I'd listen make to sure it five you got times. It right. <laughs> And now I got a Sony recorder and I can slow that down if I want. So it, sure. it, it, takes, it takes the chicken factor down. So, I mean, and, and it doesn't matter where you start, you feel that way. So uh, go ahead and feel chicken, but get on the air. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we recognize that until they do that first, you know, you can, in, in the initial class, you can do the simulated QSO and get them to the point where they get comfortable doing the first and second exchange, getting them on the air. There were, there were years where what I did was I turned my radio on, on 40 meters, because I usually do it at seven o'clock at night. And I would tune around and find somebody going at a speed that they could copy. And they'd listen to that guy calling CQ at a speed that they could copy. And then I'd call him back and I'd do a QSO. And they would go, oh, I understood everything. Great. Now you do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. they, it's just that fear factor. And once they get over that, boy, it's it's yeah. great. I but think one of the we really we really stress going faster, not you know, lightning fast, but faster, is that a lot of us that that were in my generation that got out of CW, it was because they started at five words a minute. And it was stultifying at five words a minute, even at 10 words a minute. And if you can't do 15 or more, trying to have a rag chew, you know, it's like, ah. Uh. And we want to get them past that boredom point at a speed where it's practical and you can actually start enjoying what you're doing. So that's, that's the rationale. I think one of the other things, go ahead. Go ahead, Jerry. 
I was just going to say, once they uh, they stopped requiring CW for licensing certification purposes, everyone was concerned that it would go away. Yep. In fact, what the people found was it's it's more fun than anyone. It's like a big secret. If you can do it, it's so much fun to do. So that's one of the things that uh, I wanted to kind of stress here is how much fun it can be, especially hearing your call sign come back from halfway around the world somewhere and and they're just calling you and there's those dots and dashes yeah. coming back and that to me is still yeah. the, the the magic of ham radio go ahead jim sure i yeah. couldn't agree I, more i just had one other comment um one of the other things that um uh, rob has started is a giving back program um, that, that is on the air practice for people i think that's still going on rob Oh, yes. Um, in addition to the, the CWA thing, we have a program called Giving Back, where there's, I don't know how many of us there are right now, about 20 or so, who volunteer to get on 40 meters at 7 p.m. local time, crank down to 20 or less, word per minute, and either answer somebody CQing or call CQ and engage in a QSO type exchange so that they get the practice. It's missing. Today, there's really, if you listen to the bands, you hear people going at ridiculously slow speeds or high speeds. And there's like this big void in the middle. So we're trying to fill that void and have you know between i go between 15 and 20 words a minute i'll work somebody spend 15 20 minutes in a qso and then i'll send them an email and say oh by the way there's cw academy if you're interested in getting to you know 20 or 25 here you go and i can't tell you how many people over you know the last year have joined up because of that so yeah so we do that the other thing is on Sundays at zero, actually on Monday at zero, 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 there's this group in Massachusetts, K1USN, that they have this thing called the SST, slow speed contest or slow speed test. And then, like yesterday at, uh, at zero, zero, Zool, if you turned on 40 meters, you would hear these people sending CQSST call sign at 18 words a minute. So they're getting their feet wet in contest exchanges without having to go at a blizzard rate. And at first I was a little skeptical, but I've been doing it. Last night I, I, I got 59 cues in an hour. The weekend Sunday before I had 62 in an hour. Now in CWT, my best has been like 168 in an hour but I'm going 32 to 34 words a minute. So, you know, it's all good. Now, I don't mind slowing down to 18 to help people get their sea legs in contesting because I know eventually they're going to get into CWT. I have one more question if I can. Sure. Go ahead. Um, uh, Rob, so I've learned all the bad habits. I've sinned and, you know, I'm here to admit it in public. <laughs> I learned F by saying fetch a fireman, uh, you know, all the mnemonics. And that's how I learned it when I learned it five words a minute in 2003, because I got bitten by the HF bug. And then I put CW away and, until about two or three years ago. Probably okay at 12 words a minute. I don't hesitate to contest at 20 or 25, but software and keyers are wonderful things to help me along. So, can you teach this old dog some new tricks? Like, Absolutely. can you get me there on my own with your program? Absolutely. Oh, because there's still hope. in your case, let's say you feel comfortable head copying 15 words a minute, or maybe 20, but let's say 15. So you say, okay, looking at the thing, intermediate. Let me try intermediate. So you get into intermediate. And within like a week, you're suddenly hearing letters coming at you. 
at 25 words a minute. You can't do the old mnemonics. It doesn't work. Finally, one day you say to yourself, instead of fighting, why don't I just try to hear the pattern? And there it is. I had a guy in my intermediate class a couple of years ago who could copy letters at 20 words a minute. But he said, Rob, I can't copy phrases because I hear a letter and I hear another letter. And then I, by the time I hear the third letter, I forgot the first two. And all I did was say to him, John, tell me what I'm saying. S-I-X-O-F-O-N-E. He goes, oh, six or one. I go, right. That was no faster than I just said it. And you got it right away. But I said, that you probably had trouble with. He goes, yeah. I said, what I want you to do, are you married? Yep. I said, I want you to talk to your wife for an hour or so every day, or, or half an hour because she'll think you're crazy. But just say, H-O-N-E-Y, W-O-U-L-D, Y-O-U, L-I-K-E, T-O, G-O, A, M-O-V-I-E. And he got it. He got it. And I said, John, the difference between being able to copy 20 words a minute when I spell it out versus when I send it out is you learning how to recognize that pattern and see it. When I say the word S-I-X, you see that word. When I send, you got to be able to see the S-I-X. Even though I didn't say it, I sent it. He goes, I get it. And boy, within a couple of weeks, he was just nailing it. And it wasn't a problem that he was forgetting the letters. It was the instant character recognition wasn't there yet. And then it finally clicked. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Rob. That's, that's uh, one of the most amazing presentations I've seen in a long time. So <laughs> thank you. Rob. Uh, My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Very inspirational. And uh, if we had some kind of uh, token of our appreciation to give you, we would give it to you. Um, otherwise, I hope that some of the people uh, watching here are inspired enough to sign up and uh, take advantage of uh, uh, this would be free. The best gift of all is, you know, having a few of you sign up for CW Academy. That would be the best gift you could give me. Well, thanks so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. And maybe one day we'll have you back and uh, uh, have a bunch of CW operators as a result. Uh, on Anytime. This, on this thing. Anytime. All right. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. All righty. Take Thank care, you, gentlemen. Jim. Bye. See you in the contest.